And similarly for the rare earths, these elements here, they are called rare earths. In fact, they're not that rare, or some of them aren't. But actually, we are beginning to make them rare because we are now using them for making, for example, wind turbines. And uh, hybrid cars consume a lot of those metals. So we have to be careful because we are now making a lot of other elements very scarce. By the way, carbon is white, you know? There is no problem with carbon in terms of availability. The issue with carbon is more complicated. The issue with carbon is to do with the way we use it, back to us again, and our ability to manage resources. There is no shortage of carbon in the world. But the problem we have is, of course, we are taking very old carbon and pumping it into the atmosphere. That's not such a good idea. But for other metals, it's a real limited problem. It's a problem about limited resource. So, you know, you can see some very familiar ones like gold and platinum and silver. And these, many of these metals here, like indium and gallium and germanium, these elements are essential to the electronics industry. If we no longer have these elements in 50 years, there will be no electronics industry. You know, the world will be a very different place. And some politicians are now beginning to recognize this. There's a lot of discussion in Europe, in Brussels, also in Washington. A lot of people, and in Beijing, I know, are talking about this, about what do we do? Because this is becoming, getting worse. It's not getting better. It's getting worse all the time. Because all we are doing at the moment is we are consuming more and more of those metals. And when we think about, you know, well, where do they come from? Because we can see that... Um, there's obviously still some left, so where is the residual manganese or osmium? Where is it? And the answer is it's in various places. And good news for Brazil, including Brazil, you can see. So this says uranium, tin, thallium, God, I can't read, nickel, hafnium, and aluminium. So, and in other parts, you've got copper and antimony and tin. So actually, Latin America, you've got quite a good quantity north america similar australia whoa amazing so you go to australia nowadays and they're all rich they're all walking driving big cars and having a great time you know australia has become a really strange place south africa south africa also enormous amounts different situation in south africa big political problems there of course but the reserves are fabulous china is pretty good lots of antimony indium lead Phosphorus, silver, tin, lots of metals there. And the Chinese are very clever. They know about all this. And Chinese engineers are now working in South Africa, all over Africa, and also in Australia. Maybe also here in Brazil, I don't know. But certainly there are many, many Chinese engineers working in Africa and working in Australia. So this is the situation we face. In Europe, where I come from, not a lot. Silver, we have a lot of silver. We have some copper and not much else. Europe, which is still the biggest market in the world and the highest per capita consumption of resources, has very little resource left. So Europe is really worried. Now, the interesting question is, where does all the copper go? So, okay, carbon, we turn it into carbon dioxide, it goes into the atmosphere, then we talk about carbon cycles and plants, of which you have so many in Brazil, so importantly, can take the CO2 back again, process it, make it available in the form of biomass, which of course I'm gonna talk about very soon. But what about the metals? Where does the copper go? The copper doesn't go into the atmosphere or escape the planet. The copper stays in the terrosphere. The copper goes into a device, we use it, we throw it away. It goes from one hole in the ground to another hole in the ground. The only variable is the time difference between the two. So we are just shifting it, you know? So actually, what we've done is we've taken this very precious limited resource and put it into a very difficult place to get it back again, which really, when you think about it, it's pretty crazy. And actually, we don't recycle very much. You know, we talk about recycling, but in reality, this is data mostly from Europe, which is where we could get data. And you can see most countries are still putting most waste into landfill sites. When you get to places like Denmark, the Netherlands, Germany, they are a little bit more interesting. Japan is very interesting. They burn a lot of their waste. Japan has a very limited amount of land, a very high population, a very strong industry, 
and they work with a lot of metals for electronics. So they burn their waste and they recover the metals from the ashes. So I think the Japanese are quite clever as well. But most of us are like, we just throw it away. And it goes mostly in a hole in the ground, or worse, it gets into the environment and destroys the seas, for example. What a terrible way. I mean, that really is, to me, what waste is. Waste is something that we give no value to, despite the fact it has real value. So we have to do something about this, and yet we don't. The recycling rates for metals are terrible. So this is data we were able to get for how much metals do we recycle, and you can see this is less than 1%. So lithium, again, all the metals here, the rare earths, most of the electronic metals, we do not recycle at the moment. We just throw it away. Crazy. And we think, oh, I know. OK, it's all bright. I'll go and find some more. I'll go and dig another hole in the ground and get some more copper, for example. Well, you could try. But when you do that, you find that actually the number of places where you can find new sources of metals is getting fewer and fewer. So this basically shows the number went up, and now it's coming down. And if you go to more recent years, 2011, 2012, it carries on being very low. So we are making less discoveries about new ores. And this is the price. This was the recession, but now it's starting to climb again. The cost of all of these new sources goes up and up. And that's the economic cost. The environmental cost is going up even more quickly. And of course, it's not just for metals. As you know, in many cases, new discoveries of oil, also the environmental and economic cost goes up. The Gulf of Mexico was a real example of what we are doing today, which is we are going to more and more difficult places to find sources of traditional resources. And the environmental and economic costs are going up all the time. Really, really crazy. You know, We have to shift our attitude. Now, if you think about it, you go back to the 1990s when green chemistry started. And as I said before, the driver for change was the chemical and allied industries saying, we must be more efficient. We must make less waste because waste is expensive. It costs us lots of resource. People charge us more and more money to take the waste away and treat it. It's just not a good idea. And now, we think, oh my God, we, what do we do about resources? We are running out of resources. Well, come on. I mean, you know, the resource becomes the waste. So surely what you need to do is say, in the future, we need to think about what we now call waste as a resource. So all the places where we have now what we call waste, which could be food waste, electronic waste, municipal waste, and even forestry waste is a big interesting source of carbon. These perhaps become very important resources for the future. And this is really what my center in, um, in York has been, uh, aiming, has been doing now for the last few years. And what we do is we take these interesting rich resources that we call, currently call waste, and we apply our green chemical technologies, which are the ones we are good at, and we make products. We make chemicals that go into products. We work with companies who want to carry on making cosmetics and furniture, adhesives and pharmaceuticals, clothing and food and so on. But they want future supply chains which are sustainable. They don't want to carry on using supply chains that rely on oil and metals that are running out and so on. So this is what we do. And what I want to do is give you some examples. So first of all, just one example of where we are using technologies to try and capture metals from waste streams. And one of the technologies we are using is called phytomining. And phytomining is about the ability of a plant or plants to capture metals from the ground. This is a project in collaboration with Yale in the United States and the University of British Columbia, where they have mining expertise. And basically, we use plant science. We work with plant scientists, and the plant scientists get the right plants to capture certain types of metals from waste streams. And what we are doing is we are processing those plants in a way that allows us to get nano forms of the metal. Some plants will capture some metals in nano forms, even sometimes with different shapes and sizes. And we are working on this now. It's very new. It's just started. We've got no published results yet. But just to give you an idea <coughs> of what we are doing in that area. But most of what we do is about carbon. Most of what we do is trying to find how can we make carbon 
sustainable because we are carbon-based, the environment's carbon-based. Most of the articles I showed you before are carbon-based. I mean, we don't think about computers as being carbon-based, but actually there's a lot of organic carbon in there. So just about everything we make today in society involves carbon. So we have to deal with carbon. Fundamentally, we've got to find a renewable source of carbon and to replace things like oil, petroleum. Now, this is where Brazil gets really interesting because you walk outside and things are growing. And I mean, they really grow. I, I love to stand and watch things in Brazil. I'm sure I can see them actually growing in front of my eyes. Like, wow, this is impressive, actually. So, you know, your wonderful country has this fantastic selection of biomass of types of carbon. Now, if you look at those and you think about, okay, so what can we use as a source of carbon for making chemicals? Uh, well, you know about it for making fuels. You've got a very successful bioethanol industry. That's now become the beginnings of a biochemical industry through bioethylene and biopolyethylene and biopolyethylene terephthalate. So there's some interesting developments there. And we need to be thinking about, you know, where do we get the carbon from? So you use sugar cane. You're very lucky. You can grow it in a very efficient way. But I'm looking across the world, and I'm thinking, what do we have in the world, everywhere in the world, which is a low-cost, readily available source of carbon? And actually, the answer we came to was food supply chain waste, everything what we say from farm to fork. So it includes sugarcane bagasse, wheat straw, pea pods, nutshells, all the way through the processing industries who turn that into food and all their waste streams, all the way through to retail when the food is being consumed or not consumed, as the case may be, and the waste is generated. So, you know, the United Nations recent analysis said 1.3 billion tons of food waste every year, plus about 2 more billion tons of inedible food waste, things like the shells and the straws that we don't eat. We cannot process cellulose ourselves. Animals can. We are not so good at it. So, you know, that becomes another waste stream. Now, we've been looking at where it is, so we are doing mapping. And there's some data for Brazil, which may not be correct. I mean, this is data we got from Brazil in the last couple of years. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's great. I mean, the volumes there, sugarcane, of course, is phenomenal. Almost 400 million tons a year. That's a lot. But even in Europe, you know, we process lots of food. We, don't, we do grow some in the south of Europe especially, but also, uh, for example, in my country, we grow a lot of wheat in particular, and also barley and other types of cereals, and that generates a lot of waste straws. But we also process a lot. Funnily enough, even my favorite citrus. So citrus waste, orange waste, which we have a big interest in, we actually generate a lot in the UK. We are not very good at growing oranges, but we are very good at squeezing oranges. You know, we can do that. So we bring in oranges from all over the world, we squeeze them to make juice, and then we throw away the, the bagasse, as you would call it. So we want to look at all of those sources and think about how can we use those to make chemicals, because they are full of chemicals. You, know, you cannot miss the chemicals. The chemicals are, are so easy to see. They're visible. You can smell the limonene when you squeeze an orange. Fantastic. And these are, we know these are all present, these primary chemicals and materials inside the food supply chain residues. We know about all of these product types. We can make them all. Many of them are already being sold in some applications, but not big volume. We need to get the volume up. The difference between this and the petrochemical equivalent is, the petrochemical equivalent is about 95%. This is only 5% or less. Some areas, it's a little bit higher, like biosurfactants. Probably about 20% of all the surfactants on the market in the world today are bio-based. That's been growing quite well for the last few years. But most of the areas, the volume is very small. But it's, they're all growing. The challenge is, is to make them grow quicker because the demand is there. We know. We see this data. This is from... Um, so-called Pike Research, which is one of the big management consultancy firms in the world. And this is like a lot of other data we can see. They all predict the same thing. They all say you're going to see an exponential growth in the bio-based economy. Products made from biomass. All the different types of biomass I talked about. This is real. And there are fantastic drivers for change. 
The European Union, for example, are developing standards to try and force people to use more buyer-based products. Many, many user companies are saying to their suppliers, we want bio-based products in our supply chains. Customers are saying, we like bio-based, you know? So all sorts of ways, and the price is going down as the volumes go up, as we get more efficient. Fantastic opportunity.